Hello, my name is Jen. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel, Literary Love 123, where I like to use my master's in English to spread the joy and literary merits of the horror genre to everyone who will listen. Uh, today's video is going to be the start of a vlog. So I am calling this my October vlog because spooky season is in full swing now. So in this vlog, I'll be reading three books and I'll be doing some Halloween shopping and decorating. So let me tell you about the books that I plan to read for this vlog. The first one is an audiobook for This Thing Between Us by Gus Moreno. And the next book that I'm going to read is Maggie's Grave by David Sodergren. And then finally, I'll be reading The Unmothers by Leslie J. Anderson. So as I get to the books, I will tell you a little bit more about them at that time. So after a quick intro, we will get started on day one of this vlog. the first car check-in of this vlog. I'm getting ready to leave my house on Sunday morning. It is August 4th. I am going to at home because we need some more lights for our Halloween tree and that's where we got ours um, last week. And then I'm also going to go to Target and Walmart to look for pumpkin spice creamer and other fall flavors. Um, in different kinds of foods and drinks that I've seen people posting about. So I'm hoping I'll be able to find that. And while I'm on the way, I'm going to be listening to This Thing Between Us by Gus Moreno. I know this book has been talked about as grief horror. So I know it follows this couple who buy an Itza, which I think would be like an Alexa type device. And once they buy it, strange things start happening. And then the wife dies and her husband continues to experience strange, um, you know, occurrences. And he ends up going to, I think it's an isolated cabin somewhere in like Colorado to try to cope and deal with his grief. So once I have read some of it or listened to some of it on the way, I will let you know. And I have plenty of time to get started in it because at home and Walmart and Target are about 45 minutes away from me because if you don't know, um, I live out in the country, as they say. So I will see you in my next check-in. Bye for now. These are giving Maeve fly. The eyes are the best part vibes. I would love this mat anyway but uh especially now if you know you know oh hell yes kelsey i found you a mat they still have the spooky tree that i'm obsessed with
All right, let's look at lights. What we really came in here for today. All right, car check-in. I just left at home and you saw all the wonderful Halloween stuff they have in there, but you should all be proud of me because all I got was lights today. I'll be shopping again on Wednesday, so we'll see what happens then. So I listened to this thing between us by Gus Moreno as I was making my way down here and I am really enjoying it so far. So it opened up with the main character, Thiago, at his wife Vera's funeral. So you get some very, I, I feel like, realistic depictions of grief and kind of the way that he is processing everything that's happening after the funeral questions like what do we do with the flowers um we're also dealing with different beliefs about what happens after someone dies he and his wife had different beliefs uh, from what his mother-in-law had so he's talking about that we get flashbacks to his relationship with his wife and he talks about how, you know, lying in bed one night, uh, chatting as couples do. They talked about death and what they would want done with their bodies. But, you know, he talked about how death felt like something that was very far off. We also get insight into some strange things that were happening at the condo even before they got that Itza, which is like an Alexa type device. But whenever they got the eat so the strange things really started ramping up they started getting packages delivered for things they hadn't ordered some were really weird and funny and some were kind of creepy and then also the eat so would start talking at unusual times um and then would start playing songs that seemed kind of relevant to what was happening like they were being watched or something so I'm interested to see um, what the connection between all of the Eats of stuff and uh, the death of his wife is going to be. So I'm going to go now because I've got a few more stops on the hunt for uh, Halloween uh, treats now. So uh, I will check back in with you later. So car ticking, I've got a venti tropical citrus iced energy from Starbucks because I am hot y'all. I went into Target and they did not have any pumpkin spice flavored anything but let me show you what I did get. I found silk oat creamer in maple brown sugar flavor and it's got some you know it's got some fall leaves on it so anyway that's the closest I could get today but uh, I haven't tried this uh, flavor before. I love silk oat creamer. I usually do vanilla or oatmeal cookies, so I'm in try uh, excited about trying this flavor. I am going to hit the road now for my trek back home, like 45 minutes. Um, I will check in later. <laughs> Bye. It has been a while since I checked in. The last check-in you saw was on Sunday. It is now Thursday morning around 1030. But let me talk to you about what I've been up to since the last time you saw me. So yesterday, I went to Michael's and Marshall's and Walmart and I got a few things. So let me start by showing you what I got from Marshall's. I got this candle this um caramel apple crunch it's a sand and fog candle and look how cute it is it smells so good i was so excited to find that and i also found at marshall's some fall in love coffee and it is the pumpkin spice flavor so i'm so excited to be able to have some pumpkin spice coffee. Let me show you now what I got at Michael's. So my hallway bathroom is pink and gray tiled. My house was built in like 1962. So my hallway bathroom is a little dated. Um, 
it would cost a lot of money to redo it. So I've just kind of learned to embrace the pink and gray tile. So I got these little uh, Halloween figures from Michael's because I thought they would go perfect in my bathroom. And they were like 30% off. And the next couple of things I want to show you that I got at Michael's were 50% off. So first of all, I got this uh, lovely little, I don't even know what you call this, plant type filler. But the most exciting thing is what it's going in. Are y'all ready for this? Mm, y'all know I have a post shrine here in my office. So what better way than to have a po planter over there? And again, this was 50% off. How about I just keep Edgar right here for the rest of the video? Are y'all okay with that? <laughs> no, no, I'll stop now. Um, and let me run go get what I found at Walmart real quick. I got pumpkin spice creamer. I'm so happy. I'm so, so, so happy. I love pumpkin spice. If you can't tell, I love fall. I'm so ready, y'all. I'm so excited to make my pumpkin spice coffee and put my pumpkin spice creamer in it this afternoon. I am so excited. All right, I'm going to show you one more thing, and then I promise I'm going to talk about books, which is probably what you're here for. But I wanted to show you this Thomas Hill standpipe ornament. And this is from It, Stephen King's masterpiece. And if you've read it, you know the importance of the Thomas Hill standpipe. When I went to Bangor in April of 2023, I have pictures taken of me standing outside the standpipe. And so the tour company that we did our Stephen King tour with, they sell ornaments. And I saw that they were selling the Thomas Hill standpipe ornament. So I posted it like on Facebook and tagged my husband and was like, hey, uh, don't you want to buy me this? And he didn't respond on Facebook. But a couple of days ago, I went to the mailbox and he responded in a different kind of way and surprised me with this ornament. So I'm so, I'm so happy to have that ornament. All right, now let's move into books. I am finished with this thing between us, and I really apologize that I did not do any check-ins as I was going along, um, except for right after I'd started it. I don't really know how to describe this book. It is grief horror, but it leans heavily into cosmic horror and existentialism and existentialist dread. I can't really say a lot about where it goes because I feel like that would spoil it. And I'm still trying to process some of the things that happened in it. But it does have to do, I would say, with possession to some degree, with questions about how much control do we have over our own lives? Is there some cosmic force that is um, making things happen? So all of those kinds of questions. And I'm sitting right now uh, at a 3.5 to 4. I've got to think about it a little bit more before I decide what I want to rate it. Um, but it's going to be somewhere between 3.5 and 4. I will say if you like The Fisherman, which is my favorite book of all time, then you may also like this thing between us. So again, I obviously didn't like this thing between us nearly as much as I did The Fisherman, but I did enjoy it. So I'm probably going to end up giving it a four. I started reading The Unmothers. I only am like a couple of chapters into it, but I do like it so far. So this book follows a reporter who has recently lost her husband and she's being sent to cover this really bizarre story in a very small kind of isolated town where supposedly a horse has given birth to a healthy human boy. So what she's got to go on at this point is, you know, the, the story 
of course, about the horse giving birth to this healthy boy. And also a photograph that was taken of the horse, of the father of the child, the child, and like a couple of other people. And at this point, we don't really know um, exactly how this horse became pregnant. Um, there's actually some questions about did this boy and this horse, you know, so it's really bizarre. Uh, but I do like it so far. She's made it to the town. The townspeople are, you know, somewhat friendly in certain ways, but then they're also a bit standoffish and kind of wanted to make sure that she's not going to come and wreak havoc on their town, that she's not going to represent this story in some kind of bad light. And they keep saying things to her like, you know, when you interview the young man, you need to you know, you better be good to him. I don't know. It's, I don't know where it's going to go, but I am liking it so far. But I want to share with you the opening paragraph because this is some of the best writing I have uh, read in a long time. And this is a debut novel, I do believe. So let me just read this paragraph to you. Myths about horses begin with the sea, but there is no sea near Rayford. There are small wandering creeks and the narrow bone river, but no sea. So Rayford's horses must have come from somewhere else, not fighting out of the waves, but wandering out of the dark forest, rising from the pine needles, tumbling down like ripe apples from the branches. It was easy to believe if you stood on one of the sagging porches and looked over the dark pastures and forest that the place had some of the terrible, pounding magic of the sea, the heartlessness of the sea. Dark creatures hid in the coves and shallows of its wild places like hungry eels stitched into the reefs. The blackness of midnight was heavier there, thicker and smelled like ozone and decay. It felt like it was on the edge of creation or destruction. I was hooked, <laughs> needless to say. So as soon as I have some more updates for you with the Unmothers, I will check back in. And because this one is like 317 pages, I will try to check in a lot more often than I did with this thing between us. But I'm going to go for now and I will see you in the next check-in. Look at that fine man decorating the Halloween tree. Well, this is October, everyone. Here is my Halloween tree up and decorated. Say hey. Say hey, Lucy. Cheers. Hello, you're going to see me in all my uh, fan and tank top glory. It is hot still. I hate summertime. Uh, it is Saturday afternoon around 3, 3.30ish. And I wanted to check in, 
So on the last clip, you saw a date day that my husband and I had yesterday. It was really nice. We went to Mellow Mushroom and had pizza and drinks. And then we went to Books A Million and Michael's. And I've been having some struggles with my mental health um, really throughout the whole summer. And yesterday with my daughter being back in school and my husband being off work, um, you know, he I, I told him that I felt like he curated a day especially designed for me. And that really did, uh, it really did help to, you know, kind of lift my spirits. It's not like suddenly a cure, right, for depression, but, you know, it, it does help to have a strong support system. So I just want to say, you know, thank you to my husband for yesterday. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what I got. We didn't want to or need to spend a lot of money yesterday, but I did get a couple of things. So at Michael's, I got, um, some candles, which I don't have with me right now, but I'll show them later. But I got these really cool, um, pictures. So like, you know, I hope you can tell on here. So we got like, oh, you know, nice family portraits. And then all of a sudden you change it and Ah, right. I just love these little things. So I got those at Michael's. And then at uh, Books A Million, I got Madeline Kids by Edgar Cantero. It looks like Scooby-Doo Inc. meets uh, Lovecraft. So I'm excited to read this. It's going to be part of uh, some readathons that I'm doing for spooky season. So let me just give you the synopsis. In 1977, four teenagers and a dog, Andy, Nate, Carrie, Peter, and Tim, solve the mystery of Sleepy Lake, the trail of an amphibian monster terrorizing the quiet town of Blighton Hills, led the gang to spend a night in DeBowen Mansion and apprehend a familiar culprit, a bitter old man in a mask. Yes, yeah, Scooby-Doo. Now in 1990, the 20 something former teen detectives are lost souls plagued by night terrors and Peter's tragic death. The three survivors have been running from their demons. When the man they apprehended all those years ago makes parole, Andy tracks him down to confirm what she's always known. They got the wrong guy. Now she'll need to get the gang back together and return to Blighton Hills to find out what really happened in 1977. And this time, she's sure they're not looking for another man in a mask. A mad scientist concoction of H.P. Lovecraft, teen detectives, and a love of Americana, Edgar Contero's Meddling Kids is a story filled with rich horror, thrilling twist, outright hilarity, and a surprising poignancy. So I'm excited to read this one. So let me talk to you now about what I have been reading. So I made it to page 113 of The Unmothers by Leslie J. Anderson. And I'm finding that I'm really having to focus a lot when I'm reading this book. Uh, we get a lot of different points of view. So that can be challenging. We, of course, get uh, what I would say the main character, uh, Marshall, who is investigating the story behind the story of a horse giving birth to a human baby boy. And she's in this small town. And we're meeting a cast of characters in this town, too, uh, from the young man who is the father of this baby to his mother, to his grandfather, who's kind of got this uh, power over this small town. We encounter mangled horse, you know, a mangled horse. And we've also encountered a dead body that, you know, the person died in a very bizarre way. And lying next to that person is the town drug addict. So we're also getting the story or the perspective from this drug addict, from the boy who is the, you know, I keep saying boy, young man. He's a teenager who's the father of this baby. We get points of view from his mother. We get some other points of view that I can't really say because it would be possible, you know, spoiler territory. 
We also have some mentions of folklore and changelings and the fae. We have a pastor or a minister, maybe even a priest. I don't know. Uh, some man of God in this small town. We're getting his point of view and what he thinks about the superstitions of the town. So it's interesting, but I don't know how really to explain it again, like I said, because we're getting a lot of different points of view. So hopefully next time I check in, I can give you a little bit more information, but I worry that a lot of what I give you may be spoiler. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, that's really about all I have to say right now, and I will see you in my next check-in. Hello, it's Monday, August 12th. Uh, it is about 1030 in the morning. My daughter is at school. Uh, so far this morning, I have gotten up, uh, ridden my exercise bike, uh, put on makeup, and submitted a second article this month uh, to Night Tide Magazine. So the first article that uh, I submitted is about Beverly, Carrie, Jesse, and Dolores from Stephen King's writing. And the article that I submitted today is about the influence of the school setting in the movie Ginger Snaps. And I will link both of those articles down below in the description box so you can read them if you would like to do so. Uh, so other things that I need to get done today are preparations for out school uh, classes that I'm teaching this week. And the first one I'm teaching um, is a poetry class. And then I have another class too on the folklore of fairies. And I've taught these classes before. So it's just kind of, you know, getting my mind back into the groove of things and refreshing my memory on the topics. Uh, but let's talk about the unmothers. I have made it to page 185. So I'm over halfway done now. And like I mentioned before, I'm really having to take my time with this book because we are shifting to so many different characters, points of view. And I find myself having to kind of stop and think about it when a new chapter starts and we're going to a different character. I have to kind of place that character. So if you don't like shifting points of view, this book may not work for you. I am enjoying it, but I'm not absolutely loving it at this point. I've tabbed a lot of things. It does have a lot to say about women's autonomy and about some of the desperate choices that women have to make sometimes regarding uh, their reproductive rights and that kind of thing. So it's a very you know, important uh, subject. And there is also interest um, for me too, because we are delving into folklore. I mentioned before a little bit of like fairy folklore, changelings. There's something uh, that the townspeople believe is in the woods, something that will punish men, something that will help women who may find themselves in certain situations. So there's a lot going on in this book and all of it's interesting, but I'm kind of wondering at this point in the story, if the author is trying to do too much. Um, so we'll kind of see what I think when I get finished. I am going to try to finish this book today or tomorrow and then give you my final thoughts. So other than that, that's really all I have to say in this check-in. So I will go for now and I will see you next time. Bye for now. Hello, it's Thursday, August 15th. It's about 1030 in the morning. It's been a couple of days since I checked in. I did not check in yesterday because I had a class to teach yesterday morning. And then my daughter came over, My one of my older daughters. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this on my channel or in this vlog or anything, but she is getting married in October of 2025, but she came over yesterday and we started planning for, first of all, her engagement party, which we're doing this October. So in just a couple of months and that, you know, was keeping me busy yesterday afternoon. But since I checked in last time, I did finish reading 
the unmothers. I talked about in my last um, check-in that I felt like there were uh, just a whole lot of things going on and that uh, that could possibly detract from my five-star uh, rating for this book. And I did end up rating this book four stars. It was really close though. I kept wavering back and forth between four and five stars. And I feel like it would have gotten five stars if some of the storylines have been a bit more succinct maybe. Um, but it's really, really, mm, how can I say this? You need to check trigger warnings for this because you have pregnancy, pregnancy loss, uh, trauma related to pregnancy um in general the trauma that sometimes comes with simply existing as a woman in this world uh i would classify this though as good for her horror i can't really say why exactly because that would be spoiler but if you like good for her horror then i think you will like the unmothers one of the things that I really appreciated that this book did was to show the strength of multi-generational connection between women and how that can be empowering. Uh, if you are not aware, I did um, write my master's thesis on the power of multi-generational women's connection in Stephen King's Beverly Marsh from It, Carrie White from Carrie uh, Dolores Claiborne from Dolores Claiborne and Jesse Burlingame from Gerald's Game. And that kind of sentiment about the power in numbers and the strength of women of different, uh, you know, generations shines through in this book. And it reminded me of a quote from feminist theorist Helene Sixus. So let me read her quote. If we referring to women, are legion, it's because the war of liberation has only made as yet a tiny breakthrough, but women are thronging to it. I love that quote and I love that idea of women joining up together to become a powerful force. It is a very relevant topic today. There is a passage from the unmothers that I want to read that I feel like really encapsulates this idea of the strength of multi-generational women bonding together uh, to fight for their agency, for their bodily autonomy. But I'm going to edit the quote so as not to give away spoilers. I'll take out some character names and some other identifying characteristics. So the women are about to do something powerful and this is how it's described these women are all putting their hands together one woman's nails are hot pink my little pony pink another hand joined that one gnarled with a battered gold band more and more the women coalesced around her until she felt that she was no longer just an individual, but the face of a monster, a massive creature of pain and vengeance and rage and grief. This is a very powerful book and I do recommend it, but with the disclaimer that you definitely need to check trigger warnings. So the final book that I'm going to be reading for this vlog is Maggie's Grave by David Sodergren. So I'm going to start reading that one today and I will check back in with you whenever I um, have some thoughts to share about it. Uh, I will see you in my next check-in. So bye for now. Hello, it's Friday afternoon about 1230. If I look tired, that's because I am. Uh, my daughter is home from school today because she has a cold. Um, you know, colds aren't fun, of course. Thankfully, it's just a cold, though. But as you can probably tell in my voice, I'm pretty sure I am coming down with her cold 
too. So she's actually taking a nap right now. So I thought I would take advantage of that and hop on and do a quick check-in. So since I talked to you last time, I have gotten about 12%, I think, into Maggie's grave. And I'm really enjoying it so far. But I will say that opening chapter where we get the flashback to Maggie, who is the, you know, the name in the title, and we're getting what happened to her. She was accused of being a witch. And there is a very brutal scene at the beginning where men come into her home and they do very violent things to her, which if you are familiar with the witch trials um, that took place in Europe, the European witch trials, uh, of course, occurred long before the Salem witch trials. And they were kind of a precursor to the Salem witch trials, you know, the kind of beliefs that, you know, were in Europe followed over to the settlers once they came to what we now know as the United States, but it is very brutal, very violent, um, and very much uh, in the, in the vein of historical accuracy. Uh, so it was a very very difficult opening read. Um, so that was back in the I believe the beginning of the book opens up in the 1600s. So we flash forward to more present day, and the town where Maggie was murdered. Um, you've got these four young people who are kind of out having a, you know, a good time, but there's a lot of talk about how there's hardly anybody that lives in this town or village anymore. And the, one of the main characters is just reflecting on how much she would really like to get out. She's kind of tired of her boyfriend, um, kind of tired of everything And she keeps on thinking about Maggie because the story of Maggie, uh, the woman who, of course, who was accused of being a witch and then murdered, the folklore around that um, is something that's passed down from generation to generation in this small town. And on the night that she's out with her friends, the name Maggie Wall just keeps coming to her mind. And Also, she and the other characters notice that there's a different kind of feeling in the air that night, something that feels sinister. So we get a foreboding kind of atmosphere. Uh, Some people are acting really strangely. For example, one of the characters um, is is walking with another character and they notice that I guess it's like a, a police officer or something. Uh, or a lieutenant is just staring distantly into the, you know, mountains and not really seeming to be quite all there. So we're just kind of at that point now where there's weird kind of vibes happening. And that's all I can really say right now because I'm just barely into it, but I really do like it so far. But definite trigger warning for that beginning chapter um, and probably for some things that are to come. Uh, but let me talk to you about what else I've been up to. I've also been prepping and teaching some of my classes in fall. I have more that will be starting in September. Uh, So I've been working on those. I have classes um, about poetry analysis. I have a high school semester uh, length class for Edgar Allan Poe. And then I have a kind of mini version of Poe, like a four week class for middle school students. I have a couple of mythology classes for high school, one on Norse mythology the other on mostly Greek and Roman with a little bit of Norse kind of toward the end of that class. And I also have a horror folklore uh, class about urban legends. So I've been kind of getting all those together and getting ready to teach new sections of those. Uh, Something else I've been doing is looking ahead to spooky season. I am going to be active in two readathons for spooky season one of them i'm more or less a helper for and the other one i am a co-host for but i will be sharing some videos coming up soon with uh announcements about those and 
the host, and then my recommendations for both readathons, and then my own uh, TBR and uh, things I want to watch and activities I want to do, that kind of thing. Uh, so with that, um, with that in mind, I've also been thinking about what I might want to read. Uh, so one of the things that I've been intrigued by when I heard about it recently is a book, and I'm looking at my phone to make sure I get all the information right, a book called So Witches We Became by Jill Bagachinsky. And it is YA, which I don't read and enjoy very much of. Uh, but if something appeals to me, then I will I will read it. Even if it's YA, there's nothing wrong with that. I've just found that a lot of the YA I've tried hasn't worked for me lately. But this one, I'm excited about. Uh, so here is the blurb that first attracted me to this book. A queer feminist spin on Stephen King's The Mist. This ode to female rage is a perfect pick for fans of She is a Haunting and a reminder that if boys will be boys, girls will fight back. Now, I have not read She is a Haunting, but when you tell me that we have a queer feminist spin on Stephen King's The Mist, I am definitely going to be interested. So I've listened, no, not listened. I've read a sample on my Kindle of So Witches We Became because before I used it, you know, used a credit on Libro FM during spooky season for the audiobook. I wanted to make sure that I liked the book. And I do like it from the sample I read of it. But here's the synopsis. For high school senior Nell and her friends, a vacation house on a private Florida island sounds like the makings of a dream spring break. But Nell brings secrets with her, secrets that fuse with the island's tragic history, trapping them all with a curse that surrounds the island in a toxic, vengeful mist and the surrounding waters with an unseen, devouring beast. Getting out alive means risking her friendships, her sanity, and even her own life. In order to save herself and her friends, Nell will have to face memories she'd rather leave behind, reveal the horrific truth behind the encounter that changed her life one year ago, and face the shadow that's haunted her since childhood. Easier said than done, but when Nell's friends reveal that they each brought secrets of their own, a solution even more dangerous than the curse begins to take shape. Reading like a YA feminist spin on Stephen King's The Mist, So Witches We Became is a diverse queer horror about female friendships, the emotional aftermath of surviving assault, and how to, <clears throat> excuse me, and how to find power in the shadows of your past. So it looks like there will be definite content warning for that too uh, because of the assault. Um, so couple of the other things that I've been up to lately. I'm excited that I've had two articles published with Night Tide Magazine. I will link both of those down in the description box below. Uh, one of the articles is a condensed version on my of my thesis, uh, Eclipsing the Patriarchy, the Power of Multigenerational Connection in Stephen King's It, Carrie. Sorry, my phone did a notification. It, Carrie. Daryl's Game and Dolores Claiborne. And the other article is on Sisterhood, Suburbia, and Monstrous Transformation in Ginger Snaps, which is one of my favorite movies. And you're going to hear a little more about Ginger Snaps coming up on my channel too. So that's all I have for this check-in. And I will speak to you next time and hopefully not feel so rattled in my brain. I feel like this check-in was a little bit all over the place, but you know, this is a vlog and this is my life. So that's that. And I'll see you in the next check-in. Bye. Hey, car check-in time. I'm at my standard vlog, ex you know, place. <laughs> I am about to go in and have Mexican with my best friend. This happens at least once in almost every vlog I've done. But let me just talk a little bit about Maggie's Grave. I'm about halfway through it, and I feel like this is going to be a five-star read from me. It is so good. I have gotten to a point where we've had some death, and I just want to say that a guy's parts were 
utterly destroyed and um, I'm always here for that uh, and Maggie may <laughs> or clearly has returned from the grave which I don't really think is a spoiler based on the synopsis I really like a few of the characters but I think my favorite so far is Alice and that's partially because she's a teen mom which I was also and so I feel like a really close kinship with her. There are some beautiful quotes too. Um, David Sodergren really describes the, you know, Scottish landscape beautifully. I don't have my Kindle with me, but when I get back home, I want to share one of the quotes where he describes the landscape and the scenery, and it's just really stunning. Um, but I am definitely enjoying Mackie's grave, and I am going to get ready to go in. I'll take you in and give you some footage from my lunch with my friend and I will see you in the next check-in. Bye for now. Hello, it's Sunday morning. It's about 10 o'clock. Yes, I have a cold, so you will hear that very clearly in my voice. I did not check in last night. Uh, my daughter, or one of my older daughters, and her fiance came over for dinner and then I colored my daughter's hair for her and we had a lot of laughs and it was a good night. Um, I did not record any footage yesterday when I was eating lunch with my friend at the Mexican restaurant because I believe I've shared in this vlog. I know I have in other videos that the month of July and even the beginning of August has been difficult for me mental health wise. And so I was talking to my best friend about all of that. Uh, there were tears. I may have cried into my margarita. So it just didn't feel like a good time to film. But just to show you what a wonderful best friend I have. And it's not just because she gives me nice things. It's because she genuinely loves me and cares about me. And I feel the same way about her. And I just want to say it's good to have a friend like that. So she gave me this very sweet surprise gift. Um, so let me just show you what she got me. These super cute star face Hydro Star pimple patches. So when I get a zit, nobody has to look at it. I can put the star on it. <laughs> She also gave me this wonderful bath bomb, Lavender Love. So I'll be soaking in a bath maybe tonight. I feel like that would be a perfect way to kind of end the weekend and just soak in a warm bath, especially because I'm dealing with this cold. She also got me these really cute, reusable makeup removing cloths and... You know my love for mugs, right? I did do a sharing of my favorite mugs, and then I turned it into a cozy uh, coffee mug book tag video. So, yeah, she got me a mug that says Basic Witch. And I will be drinking some coffee from this mug later today. So, other than that, my plans for today are to hopefully finish reading Maggie's Grave. And also, uh, I want to watch Lisa Frankenstein because it's on Amazon Prime and I haven't seen it yet. But back to Maggie's grave. I haven't read any more since the last check-in. But when I did my car check-in, I mentioned that I wanted to uh, read one of the quotes from Maggie's grave where author David Sodergren is describing the Scottish landscape. So here's that quote. They took the main road out of town, the fields giving way to acres of pine forest that stretched into the twilight, the cloud-masked October sun descending behind the imposing mountain. I love that. So we've got very gnarly body horror mixed with very beautiful descriptions of the Scottish countryside. So it's all good. Uh, so I will see you in the next check-in and goodbye for now. Hey, 
Okay, so it is Monday morning, August 19th, and I am going to conclude the vlog by sharing the candles I mentioned earlier that I got at Michael's by talking about uh, my thoughts on Lisa Frankenstein, and then finally my final thoughts after finishing Maggie's Grave. So let me first of all show you the candle that my husband picked out um when we were at michael's he wanted a uh, autumn walk and i don't know why i'm showing it to you i mean it's just a very simple candle it's not like you can smell it um and yes i still have a cold so my smell isn't as strong as it normally would be either so i'm not even going to open these up um and the one i picked was pumpkin pie so no surprise that mine is something connected to pumpkins uh, so quickly, my thoughts on Lisa Frankenstein. I really had a good time with it. I feel like that's going to be a rewatch for me uh, on a regular, you know, cycle with a lot of my other rewatches. I find it uh, comforting. So I feel like I will also consider it a comfort movie. And I was kind of describing it to my best friend as Beetlejuice meets Edward Scissorhands meets Heather's throw in. Uh, Frankenstein and some Romeo and Juliet vibes. Uh, one of the things that I did notice about the movie is that the character of Lisa in some ways is patterned um, after Mary Shelley um, in that both of them lost their mothers. They live with uh, stepmothers, have a stepsister. Also, Mary Shelley spent a lot of time at her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, grave uh she did etchings on graves learned to uh write that way um there are also rumors about mary shelley um having her first uh sexual encounter with percy shelley on top of her mother's grave but again that's just that's a rumor not necessarily true but so you had those kind of elements that were a little bit of a nod to mary shelley herself I thought that the movie was fun. Um, there were some parts that I was pretty shocked by. Um, and I feel like that'll segue nicely into some of my thoughts about Maggie's grave. Uh, I, I don't really want to say much about the movie as far as what happened at one point. But uh, suffice it to say, there's something kind of similar that happens in Mackie's grave. <laughs> so in the last half of Maggie's grave, uh, some of my thoughts are that there were sections that sort of reminded me of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery because there's this ritual that the town townspeople do in order to sacrifice possibly one person for the good, for the so-called good of the rest of the village in order to appease Maggie. Um, some of the other notes that I have, I like the way that David Sodergren wrote um, some of the women characters. Now, I mentioned earlier that the there's an American, you know, young woman who comes over to Scotland, and I just really was rooting for her to die, to be honest but some of the main women characters were very strongly written um one of the characters beth um at one point she has to try to settle down her you know i would say i hate this word but you know it gets it gets used but hysterical boyfriend so he's the one who is panicking and doesn't know what to do and she's kind of that voice of reason um, and then at a later point, uh, because she was able to calm him, he's able to be supportive for her. And so I can't really say anything else about the specifics of what happens to them. Um, and I don't really want to talk about who makes it toward, you know, to the end of the book, because I've, that's definitely going to be a, a spoiler. But I still felt the bond all the way throughout with Alice, who is the teenage mom. Um, there are elements here about friendship and what it means to be a friend. Definite elements about the bond uh, between a mother and her children. 
And so there's also that kind of connection between Alice and her child and Maggie and the child that was literally ripped from her body um, when she was accused of being a witch. So you had some commonalities there. There were some aspects that reminded me a little bit about um, the movie, The Autopsy of Jane Doe, um, when it comes to a woman being accused of being a witch. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't, but a lot of it has to do with very well-earned uh, women's rage. Uh, and so I feel like David Sodergren did a good job um, depicting that. Another interesting element that um, I noticed when I got to the end of the book is that David Sodergren actually based this book around um, a grave that you can go to in Scotland. So I took some notes there. Um, he said it's in the Scottish village of Dunning in Perthshire. And he said the grave says um, something like here lies Maggie Wall burned as a witch, but for the sake of the story, he changed it to here lies Maggie Wall buried as a witch. So that way you could get the whole idea of Maggie's grave and what takes place um, that kind of brings her back uh, to life when she comes back to life. And I think that's about all that I have to say about Maggie's grave. Uh, oh, the rating, five stars, uh, hands down, no question about it, five stars. Uh, so I had a really successful um, reading vlog when it comes to enjoying the books that I read. And I thank you so much if you have hung in here with me this long. This is a long vlog. So I really appreciate your time that you've spent. Uh, I would love it if you would like this video, if you would subscribe, if you would hit that bell. Let me know down below. Have you read any of these books uh, and what did you think of them? Have you watched Lisa Frankenstein and what did you think of it? If you want to just leave something, but you don't know exactly what to say, uh, you can leave me um, some kind of witchy or cemetery gr or grave kind of emoji uh, for Maggie's grave. And I will see you in my next video. Thank you again for watching. Bye.